Good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Professor. Wow. Good afternoon. You got wow. You, wow. I love you guys. Seriously. <laughs> even even though it might be going in only one direction right now, I really do. Wow. You guys went. Okay. Hang on. The board is coming in. And also my board just crashed. How did it crash before it even came in? Hold on one second. Sorry, sorry. Um, you guys are amazing, especially given how much you could potentially hate me right now. Um, and I hope to see you all in 204. But good afternoon. Okay. From whoa. Oh, from hell yeah. I thought that said from all. Good afternoon. That'd be amazing. Okay. Hold on. I'm just getting the board. And I have much things to tell you. I know. And things to okay. Um, and I missed you. And blah, blah, blah. And when I say love, I mean it in a professional way. I don't even know what that would mean. Okay. So hello, hello. I got I saw hello, Caroline. Hello, um, Savannah. I think hello, Amanda. Hello, Caitlin. Hello, Christina. Hello, Kevin. Hello. I'm so confused. Did I say amen? I said okay. Okay. And good afternoon, Felicia. Good afternoon, Jamalette. Good afternoon, Amanda. Good afternoon, Kevin. Good afternoon, Chloe. Good afternoon, David K. Good afternoon, Kaylin. Good afternoon, Adon. Hi, Christina. Good afternoon, Ali. I like the heart. Okay. Hello, hello. Okay, here's so, so much to catch up. So here's the deal. A lot of you have gotten exams back. Some of you have not. I'm very aware it is still essentially random. It's not based on anything. And I apologize that this is, I don't know why this is taking me so, yes, I do. Uh, it's taking me way too long, but a lot of you have them back. Some of you don't. We're, and you will be getting that. They're just, they're just coming back as we, I mean, they're just coming. Um, I mean, obviously I can't, I'm not doing anything else besides them now. I won't stop until they're done. I apologize to those of you who don't have them back yet. And I apologize, well, I don't, and to those of you who do have them back, I know some of you are probably happy with the number and some of you are not. Uh, 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 and those of you who are not happy with your number, you might not be happy with yourself or you might not be happy with me or something, something. I'm here to say still to all of you, for the most, I think to all of you that I'm seeing in the room right now, even if you are not happy with your number, which I understand you're all very strong students, you're used to good numbers, you, 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 uh, good afternoon, Amy, good afternoon. Even I'm telling you this as per, like, I feel like I'm getting to know some of you somewhat like in re as a real person. So I'm even just guessing based on how hard you work and who you are, that some of you might be disappointed. Some of you might find your number disappointing. It's very likely that if so, that you're more disappointed in it than I am. Just to be clear, you might be more scared than I am. And that this is not all of you. I'm just, and again, I know some of you still haven't gotten the back and I, and that's disappointing in a whole different way or frustrating in a whole different way. And I'm going to address all of this, but, and I know it's easier to address all this once you all have them back, but just because I want to keep moving on and not whatever. Um, what I'm trying to say is, first of all, all of you are still doing fine in the class, especially if you're like here right now. E I want to remind you, and I'll remind you even more extensively, like after everybody's gotten them back and whatever, um, and I will talk to any one of you in per, oh, the board just disappeared again. I'd be happy to talk with any of you in person, either about specific things on the exam, like if you can't read my handwriting or you question something I did or something, all of that is fine. I mean, there's a difference between asking a question versus arguing. I mean, there's different ways, but I just want you to know I make mistakes. And there are things that I need to clarify with some of you. It's it, and there's no statute of limitations. Like if there, if you are concerned about your number, or like by the way, especially if you just think I added up the points wrong, well then obviously that's my mistake and bring it to my attention and I'll fix it. I just as happy for all of you to be as high for for your grades to be as high. I, it's just as important to me as you, that your grades be high as it is to. No, it's probably not as important to me. But anyway, what I'm saying is. If there's an issue in one of your exams, let's schedule a time. We'll figure it out. Um, um, whether it's that you, you, I need to explain something to you, or you need to show me a mistake I made, I, I'm, I'm willing to take things back. Like, not, okay, and it doesn't have to be tonight for that to happen. That's number one. Number two, let me just—I don't know why I sound defensive about that, but I always all these numbers and all this stuff always 
believe me, I know how freakish it is to everybody. I know you wouldn't be a, a student in this major if you weren't like very concerned about your performance in your life and all of that. So let me also just remind, and, and again, by the way, I think the numbers, a lot of numbers were very, very good. Um, and I think even a lot of the tests where even the number didn't maybe seem good to that person, I could still tell how much talent and intelligence and accuracy was in the test. I can make those distinctions in my mind, believe me. And none of you is just a number in my mind. And also on that, this all sounds like soft rationalization or something, but also let me just remind you all how the grading works. I'm gonna to have to talk about this more with everybody once you all get them back. But let me remind you that the grade you get at the end of the semester is not the grade that you got on this exam, nor is it even just the average of this exam plus your final exam. Please remember that the grade you get at the end of the semester is based first, first we average the exams, yes, with your lab average, yes. Like first you get an average of your two, your midterm exam, your final exam, and your lab average. So that's three numbers get averaged together, yes. Then please remember that all the points that you have already gotten back and the for homeworks and game turns and all that stuff, plus many points that I still owe all of you and that you will still get credit to your uh, uh, to your pile, like whether you've seen them yet or not, all those points that you get for homework and game turns and all that, all those points are accumulating. And then they you have this pile of points at the end. Many of you, by the end, will have a pile like points, you know, like, like over 100 points or something like that. The number gets divided by a scaling factor, a scaling factor that's true, that's the same for all. I'm just reminding you, just, just so you know, like at the end of the semester, all, all of the points that you've accumulated, including many that you didn't even see until the final minute because I like scrambled to catch up and put all those points back in and send them to you, like all those points get accumulated in a pile, then they get divided by some scaling factor, which is the same for every single student, say the dividing factor is like uh, is like 10. So say you have 100 points accumulated from all of your game turns and all of the other game things that you could still, you know, like game submit avatar or whatever, which you could still turn in and all of your homeworks, all those points, say you have 100 points accumulated, say the dividing factor at the end, which we never know to the end, but which is the same for every student, say the dividing factor is like 10. So you have this 100 points, it gets divided by 10. So that makes 10, right? This is just an example, but it's a typical example. So you have 10. What does that 10 mean? It means literally 10 points then get added to your average like before your final grade is computed. That is a typical number for anybody who's basically been doing the game turns and or homework. You will typically, typically get something like 10 points added to your average at the end before your final grade is computed. So so in other words, people typically have a grade on their final, their final grade. And again, I will happily talk with anybody about this individually, whether it's about your exact, your actual exam questions that you have, or just like your concern about yourself in the course, if you have such concern. Typically the grade that people end up getting for this course is typically like around 10 points higher than, or, or more than, it's more, usually it's like 15 points higher than what they see as their midterm exam score. Please know that you're, if you got, so to be even more concrete, and again, I know I'm, I sound frantic. I'm a little frantic because I missed you on Monday because I still need to get some of these exams back to some of you. And because I know whenever exams come back, it causes like some things that I just want to address fast. like like. To be concrete, okay, to be concrete, even if you're all used to A's or you're used to thinking that nothing less than a 90 will ever satisfy you or your husband or your wife or your parents or whatever, let me tell you right now that if you got in the 80, if you got in the 80s on this exam, you're fine. Like, don't even think twice about it. Like, that's a starting point. Like, if you got in the 80s on this exam, like, that's already above the average, that's above the average. And it means if nothing else happened for me, if you just continue going the way you are and your final exam wasn't a big departure from that, then you're probably getting an A or, or an A, maybe an A minus, but probably an A. So first, let me start with that. Don't think that an 82 on this exam means you're getting a B minus in the course or something. It doesn't. Second of all, I don't mean that your 
screwed if you got less than the 80s. Not at all. Like so far, the average seems to be about in the, in the low 70s or something like that. If you got in the 70s, you're fine. You, there's still a final exam and all these other points. And corollary to that, if you got in the 60s on this exam, and, I, and some of you did, if you got in the 60s, it does not mean you're failing the course. I just, that's the. It might mean, okay, maybe you should talk to me. Maybe we should make sure to straighten out some things or figure out some things that you can do better on the final exam. Like I'm not trying to sweep anything under the rug or say anything like that. But nobody who's in the room right now who's hearing me, whether you got your exam back or not, nobody in the room right now should be thinking, well, especially if you got it and you saw the number, nobody in the room right now should be thinking, oh my God, I'm totally getting an F in this class. Like it's not the case, okay? It, if, and again, also that does not mean, and when I say F, F or D, whatever, whatever anybody's worst nightmare is. Now, let me also quickly say, I'm not saying no one has, has ever gotten an F or a D in a class. Every semester, some people do. But, but if you're in that situation that you're getting an F or a D in the class, first of all, we're go, I'm gonna reach out to you or you're gonna reach out to me. If you think that you're that person, reach out to me and we'll straighten it out. Don't think you're that person automatically just because of some number on your document. Honestly, honestly, generally the people that get an F or a D in this class or something are people that like, haven't turned anything in, didn't turn in the exam or aren't even here right now to be hearing me say this or something, like uh, not to be, okay? So just, I don't, even though I sound panicked right now because exams panic me every time because I'm no different, you know, because I've never caused this to all because I'm, but, but even though I sound edgy right now, Nobody, especially if you got a number back, if you caught a number back, it means you did what you were supposed to, you did something, you got it back. If there's issues, we'll talk about it, but nobody should be thinking, oh my God, like I just sealed my fate. I'm totally gonna fail this class. And like, I can't even continue in the major. Like, don't go there. That's number one, or that's number one, two, and three. Uh, and again, I'm happy to have private conferences with anybody. I honestly, in my heart, I'm saying all this too, because I feel like I'm getting to know many of you. I, there were certain exams I looked at and I'm like, I can see the, I can see the strength. I can see the talent. I can see how hard this person's working. And I see this person every day in Zoom. I'm worried that they're going to be worried about this number. I'm not worried about them, but I'm worried that they're going to be worried. Like literally I had that reaction to some of the exams. So I'm just, and you can even ask me in private if you're one of those people that I mean. So I'm just saying that right now to hopefully reassure you that I I, I see more than just that number. Okay, that's number one, or that's number one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Now on a more concrete note, on perhaps a more reassuring note, and this applies to everybody, even if you didn't get your, oh, and there's more people, sorry, there's people in the waiting room, you probably just chatted to tell me that, I'm sorry, hold on. Ay, 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 ay. They've probably been here since 1967. Plus my board, or is one of them my board? Hold on. Wait, where are they? Where are they? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I have more concrete things. Wait. Oh, 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 is it? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, and thank you, Alicia. Sorry, I totally see. I'm all in my head. Thank you, Alicia. There, Sam. Sorry, people who are in the waiting room. Um, but Elda, great question. Like, uh, so Elda's asking, could you still submit homework that we might have missing? Is there a deadline? The deadline is the... It, is the last day of classes. You totally still could, yes. And and as far as, yes, you can still submit things for more points and I still owe you things too. And I know that. And that's part of what I'm saying too is there's compassion in both directions. We're all struggling. We're all working hard. We're all overwhelmed. We're all trying to make ends meet. And that means all of you. And I know that. And me too. So no, like you can still, anyway, we're getting to that point in the semester where I'm looking, scrambling to try to get you back your things. You're, if you're starting to worry about your grades and stuff like that, absolutely. If, if you're in that mode where you're like looking for where can I get more points, I'm with you. Like, sure. So yes, you can still turn in old homeworks for points. Absolutely. And I still have to turn back some too many of you. And even if you haven't gotten the back yet, know that this is one good thing about Google Classroom. They're all there. They're in my thing. The points will be accounted for and you'll get the points. And for anything like homework, anything like that, you never get deductions. It's only points that you could get. So, so yes, if you have old things that you could still turn in, it's worth doing that. Do that. Sure. Um, with game stuff, 
The game turns, the nightly game turn is the one thing that I don't want old ones. It, that It's silly to go back and turn in things from like weeks ago, what you did that day in class. Don't do that. But any of the special games, the ones that technically I think just were due or do like December 1st, those are special ones, like showing video, showing avatar, show, subscribe, you know, using the YouTube channel, anything like that, you definitely could still turn in those. Go look for any of those that apply to you at all. I mean, it's all optional, but it's all just points that you can get that will help, okay? So so good question. Wait, oh, sorry, sorry. Let me see. Um, oh, there's a question in the chat. Oh, right, right. And same thing to Caroline's question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Like like anything that you did turn in, got back, but you didn't get full credit for, you can redo for more credit and turn in before the last day of classes. Yes. Like any, yes. And again, even there, you have to sort of trust me that I won't be able to get it back to you like immediately. But if you trust that anything that's in my system is worth some number more points to you, which it is, then yes, absolutely. The last day of classes, I use as the last day for to turn in all kinds of loose ends like that. And then that's because then the rest of the time we have to grade the exams and put in your grades. Um, so yes, Caroline and and Elda. Yeah, okay, cool. Now also on that, wait, what was that? Um sorry, the board, let me get the board back up. Also on that, and again, I know this is all, and again, let, let me. I know I sound edgy. I'm look, I'm just nervous because I still haven't gotten back to some of you the exams, and that's my fault. And it makes me, but I I am as wanting you guys to get good grades. I shouldn't say I'm as wanting. I mean, obviously it's more important to you, but please just remember we we both want you to get good grades. I want you to get legitimately good grades. Like I don't want you to cheat and I don't want to cheat for you. So I don't want them to be gifts. And they won't be. Because again, just remember the way this whole system works is there's always some people that fall by the wayside. They're generally the people that aren't even here to be listening to these speeches. And that and and that's what shows that if you do get a good grade in the class, it wasn't automatic. You do have to do something to get it. And I have to do something to get you there. But we all want to get there. And you're not in competition with one another for your grades in this class. That's also super important to remember like there's no limit on how many a's there are so you helping one another is a good thing not a bad thing but anyway on that so on that you might notice that in google classroom right before um class started i posted something that said extra points on the exam let me explain that right now it applies to all of you it's, it's an option Again, e, especially if you've seen your score, you, you, you might care about this. If you haven't yet seen your score, it still applies to you and it's optional. But what's going to happen is I'm like, when I stop this babbling now, I'm going to give you, I'm going to continue with the physics that we still need to know for the class. You know, we need to know for the final exam and stuff like that. I'm going to continue with physics. I'm going to start by, I'm going to show you a problem. Like, whoa, here, I'll show you. Okay, this right here is a problem I'm calling horizontal hall, like like H-A-U-L, horizontal hall. Um, I'm gonna explain this problem. Here are the facts of the, it's a Newton's law problem. So it's on the new topic. It's not from your exam, it's the new topic, okay? But it's a problem I'm gonna spend the rest of this period explaining any, like talking about it and giving you facts that you need to solve it. Um, but the ultimate problem is given these facts that are presented in this picture right here, the ultimate question is solve for acceleration, show all work to solve for acceleration. I'm going to break it down and spend the rest of the period sort of talking about it. But I'm going to say right now, as an option to any, rather than doing test corrections or things like that, that'll sort of like bring us backwards rather than forwards in the material, I'm just going to say, that anybody in the, that there's a portal now open for this. If you submit a complete and full solution, if you solve for the acceleration in this situation, sort of according to the steps and the procedures that I'm about to sort of show you, I'll get as far as I can in solving it for you as I can. But if you submit a full solution to this problem by midnight of uh, next Wednesday, a week from today, if you submit a full solution to this, 
Uh, um, we, if you submit a full solution to this problem, I'll give you up to and probably exactly eight points to add to your exam score, like eight points straight on to your midterm exam score. That applies to everybody. In other words, uh, we'll consider what you want, eight points of extra credit, but I will increase your exam score by eight if you turn this in by um, next Wednesday. Now, eight is somewhat significant, as you know, eight can literally be a full letter grade change. That's a little bit more than I usually would offer, but partly this is also in acknowledgement and concession for the fact that it's taking me longer to grade these than it really should. And I'm sure that's causing you anxiety. So just, so that's partly what this is about, but basically whatever your score is on the exam, if you do this by next Wednesday, you'll get eight more points directly on the exam. Hopefully that will help some of you. Hopefully it'll ease your mind. Again, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. Um, and again, I will spend the rest of the period sort of talking about it and breaking it down. I do want a full solution. I want you it to be, even though it's the new material, I want you to do it in the style of an exam um, to help practice and prepare you for the final exam. Um, and I'm about to move on. Let me make one more, now that I've said all that about the numbers and the grades, and again, I'm trying to, tell you it's could it be better than you think but nothing in my tone of voice probably makes that sound true but it is true in terms of your exams and again some people still haven't gotten them back and i know that and i apologize but a lot of you have i think um i think they were good i think you do know what you're doing i think you're working hard and i think they showed a lot of integrity a lot of the exams um there were some specific physics things that I may still go over once everybody's gotten them back. But one overarching comment, let me just ask for everybody on the final exam. What I think a lot of people did a great job of like really breaking down their solutions into step one, step two, step three. People really made it largely as clear and easy for me to follow their full thought process as they could, as you could. One thing, let me just ask all of you, go an extra step in spreading out your work like make it really big if possible like make your handwriting bigger and skip more lines and like some of the exams were beautiful they were gorgeous and like they were all fit on like some gorgeous whiteboard or whiteboard app or something like that or one and there was like different colors and all these beautiful diagram, diagrams and stuff but some of them were so precise and so artistic and so pristine, pristine that they all fit in like this one block. And it's actually becomes really hard to follow. And even though it's beautiful, it becomes hard to manage and hard to grade and hard to see. So just let me, and also I think it's harder on you to try to cram your thoughts together like that. Just one big suggestion is however, like spread out your work more like spread it out a lot definitely every time you start a new problem start a new page please for sure um and, and you know if you're on lined paper skip lines if you're not on lined paper just try to try to use a lot of space to do what you're doing and make it as super readable and clear as possible that's just anyway all right um i'm going to talk about this problem uh um yeah if I'm going to, all right, yeah, I'm just going to go on. I mean, if you stop me, definitely put in the chat or the private chat, any questions, if concerns you have about exams or grades or anything, put in the chat. I'm going to, well, is it clear that this problem I'm now going to, sorry. All right. Um, yeah, put any questions or anything in the chat. Um, oh, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Oh. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's all. Well, okay. Hold on. Oh, okay. There's a bunch of things in the direct chat. Give me one thing.
Okay, oh, and so, okay, closed caption, okay. Um, oh, and one, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, there's a lot happening in direct chat. Give me a second, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 oh, one question in the direct chat. This is a fair question. I'll say the, oh, this, yeah. One question that's in the direct chat is, is there a firm date for the final exam or not yet? There is, I could tell you, I mean, I'll put this in Google Classroom stuff. The way the final exam works is it works the same way as the midterm in that it's going to be take home, just like the midterm. And you're going to have time to do it just like the midterm. And there will be like review or practice or whatever before. What I can tell you right now is generally the final exam in physics will be due back to me from Google Classroom the second to last day of exams. Like if all of exams end on Thursday, which I think they usually do, then your exam will be due back Wednesday. In other words, just to give me a little time to actually grade it and get your grades in on time. But you could safely assume that you'll have the whole, minus one day, you'll have the whole exam period to do your exam. And it'll be posted like the day after the last day of classes, like it'll be posted. So, so firm date, I'm not looking at a calendar right now, so I don't remember the exact dates, but if, 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 if classes end on December 12th or 14th or something like that, like the day after the last day of classes, essentially I post the exam and then you have the full exam period minus one day to turn it back and hand it in if that so i'm not looking at a comment but let me know direct chat person tell me if that act I, that's a very fair and important question um and i'm i know i'm being sputtery and vague but tell me direct chat person if i if that answers what you're asking but yeah to everybody you'll have the exam period to um to do your exam and what i'm kind of trying to say to everybody too again is i'm not saying stop working or i'm not saying you know like assume like i'm not saying don't work or don't keep working or don't stay plugged in i'm saying that i think a lot of you are working and that and that is apparent to me even if it's not apparent to you that it's apparent to me so i'm saying keep doing what you're doing oh cool cool okay cool i'm saying keep doing what you're doing and for the final exam what what i honestly think really is that a lot of you actually did study properly for the midterm like i think you did like, I think you understood what I was looking for. And I think you really did try to do that, which is no small claim because it's an unusual kind of an exam. And I think your approach to the final exam should probably be very similar. I would say, please make a bigger point of trying to spread all your thoughts out. Like, I, that's a psych, that's actually much more important even to your own performance than you might realize. It's not just about me reading it, but, but. So if you're going to change anything from now to the final exam about your habits or anything like that, one thing is I would say, yes, definitely spread out. But then two, I guess here's a fast thing to say to all of you too, like a little piece of advice or whatever. See, I'm afraid to go down this whole rabbit hole right now. This could be a rabbit hole. Let me just think for a second. Uh, you could remind me. I, there's another piece of advice I can give before the final exam th that I picked up on looking at your midterms, but, and you can remind me of that, but I'm going to wait till everybody gets the midterm back so it doesn't stress people out more or something like that. But just remind me, there's one more piece of sort of larger advice I can give of how to maybe tweak your habits or improve your habits before the final exam, but I'll wait on that so I don't go down the rabbit hole right now. But, but, largely to everybody just don't give up that's really what, don't stop but don't give up and don't be dismayed just keep on doing what you're doing and and I, and i think for the most part it's going to work out for all of us and if you have any concern at all definitely of, of any kind definitely text me or you know let's work it out privately um okay okay um okay So just to raise your hand if it's this problem that's sitting on the screen right now is the eight point problem 
that is referred to in Google Classroom that I'm going to try to, I'm going to give you a bunch of facts about now. But, but oh, oh, Amy, oh, Amy, are you raising your hand because you know I was about to say raise your hand if it's clear, or are you raising your hand because you have a question? Or, okay. So, yeah, okay. Is it, is that why you're, yeah. So, is it clear that this is the eight point problem? Is it clear that the, sorry, I love this class so much. See, yeah, okay. See, this is what I mean, you guys. Okay, okay. All right. You just kind of, see you're kind of, like what you're just calming me down. Okay, great. Thanks. So it's clear. All right. So that's going to go over now. Thank you guys. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody. Okay. And I hope to see you in 204. Okay. Um, No, sorry. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so we're going to solve this problem. We're going to solve this problem with all the procedures that we've been saying in class for the last two weeks and that you sort of were doing in lab for lab number five. We're going to draw a system schema. From the system schema, we're going to draw a pure free body diagram. From the pure free body diagram, we're going to draw a component free body diagram. We're going to break vectors up into their components, draw a component free body diagram. From that, we're going to apply F net equals MA as a vector equation to each axis uh, um, uh, uh, and add and subtract all the forces found in those axes to solve for A. That's the procedure we're going to follow. But first, there's one like a uh, subtopic that I need to show you that came up in lab five. And that is how to deal with the specific idea of two surfaces pushing together. The whole idea of two lines in the system schema or in other words, the whole idea of friction, right? Like we haven't explicitly broken that down in lecture yet. So let me do that first. And, and we're going to apply it to this. And that's the purpose of this problem, really, is to look at friction. OK, so first,
Okay. So here's how friction works. Here's the deal with friction. Remember we said a week ago that anytime two rough surfaces, two, two rough surfaces press or push against each other, we said that realistically that entails, that means that two forces are acting at the same time. When two surfaces push against each other, First of all, they push against each other. They push along an axis that is perpendicular to the plane of contact. If the plane of, so if my two hands are like two slices of bread in a bologna sandwich, and the bologna we refer to as the plane of contact, the plane like the area, like the two dimensional surface against which the two material surfaces are pressing. So when, if this is the plane, if my two hands are pressing against each other and this is the plane of contact, I can imagine an axis perpendicular to that plane, or as we say in math and science, normal to that plane, normal just meaning perpendicular. So when two surfaces press, they press along that, in the direction of that axis that's going perpendicular to the plane of contact. That force, that pressing against force is called the normal force, just meaning perpendicular to the plane of contact. But what we're saying is that if the surfaces are rough, that means that if you were to look at them microscopically, you would see that they're ridgy, they're bumpy, they're and, and, and they've like, like mountains and valleys and nooks and crannies on the surface. So that as they press into each other, they start locking into each other as though you were putting two combs together, the, the teeth of the combs lock they they interlock and so then the two combs or in this case the two surfaces become harder and harder to rub along each other right so what we're arguing in the end in the system schema whenever two systems whenever two surfaces push against each other we draw two lines in the system schema saying that this always ends up entailing this this force the normal force always ends up producing or bringing with it a force of resistance along the sliding rubbing axis, the axis that's parallel to the plane of contact. So the force that occurs parallel to the plane of contact, we call friction. The force that's, a, yeah, that's perpendicular to the plane of contact, we call normal. We're saying that whenever surfaces are rough, the normal force will always bring with it a friction force. Or, and put another way, you can't have a friction force unless you have a normal force. They're, they're, they're really two components of one overall phenomenon. The phenomenon is rough surfaces pushing against each other. Okay, so that's what we were saying qualitatively last week. Now I'm going to be more quantitative about it. I'm going to be more mathematical. I'm actually going to say, yes, not. Uh, the normal force brings with it a friction force. And in fact, I'm going to, and if there's no normal force, then there's no friction force. But similarly, the more normal force you have, the harder these two things push, the more friction force you have. In other words, they're proportional to each other. In fact, I'm going to go a step even further and say it turns out to a large degree of approximation, of, of reasonable approximation in reasonable situations, in the lab controlled situations, it turns out that the friction force that's applied by, from, by one surface on another is in fact roughly directly proportional to the normal force. In other words, it's a linear relationship. If we were to make a graph, as you see here, where we graphed frictional force as a function of normal force, we would find that the y-intercept is zero. We would find a, a curve that starts at zero. In other words, when there's no normal force, there's no friction force. And we would find as the normal force gets increased, as the things get pushed harder and harder against each other, the friction force gets increased at the same rate, approximately. The slope of this line is constant. I'm saying that the frictional force between any two objects is directly proportional to the normal force that, that, that this is in effect a y equals mx plus b situation where b is zero. 
So y equals mx here, like, like force is directly proportional. Uh, uh, I mean, friction force is, normal, is directly proportional to normal force. Now, so I'm saying the slope of this graph would be constant. The slope, the rise over the run, right, in this case would be the change in friction force per the change in normal force, right? That would be the slope of this line, like delta, it's like y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, only the y's are f's and the x's are n's and they're all measured in newtons, right? They're both forces. The slope of this line is called mu. Let me go to the next page. Okay, so the force of friction is directly proportional to the normal force. The constant of proportionality, the slope of that line, the slope is known as mu, the lowercase Greek letter mu. Now mu is a number, it has no units, it's a pure number. It it has no units because it's force units divided by force units. It's Newtons divided by Newtons. They cancel out. So it's a pure number. Pure numbers in, in physics and in science are often called coefficients. Uh, they're especially called coefficients when they, if they tend to be pure numbers that are fractions. And mu does tend to be a fraction or a decimal. In other words, friction is, I mean, I mean, mu tends to be a number greater than zero because um, this line tends not to be horizontal. Um, it tends to be greater than zero, but it does not tend to be greater than one. So mu represents how much frictional resistance you get per each Newton of squeezing like for every so the harder you push two things together the more they resist the exact number is determined by mu um 
So, so mu is the number of newtons of rubbing resistance that you get for each newton of, 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 of pressing contact. Why would mu ever be higher in one situation than it would in another? Like, why is mu not always the same number? We're saying some in, in one situation, I would press two things together and I would get some amount of resistance. In another situation, with other materials, I might press the two materials the exact same amount, but get a lot more resistance. Why would that possibly be? It would be if the materials in the second example were a lot rougher than the materials in the first example. In other words, mu, the coefficient of friction, the ratio of frictional resistance that you get per each Newton of normal force, what mu really is a representation of or a measurement of is the types of material, how rough they are. The higher the mu, the rougher the material. It's actually that straightforward. So, so literally mu is called the coefficient of friction it's a, a pure number without units that ranges between zero and one generally. And it represents how rough the materials are. So if you put glass, if you put like an air hockey puck on air, so if you have a puck on air, the coefficient of friction is like super close to zero. If you were to put a puck of hockey on like glass or ice, maybe the coefficient is like, is like 0 0.002 or something like that. Then if you were to put a hockey puck on, on, on plastic, maybe it's like 0.1. If you put a hockey puck on wood, maybe it's like 0.2. And on and on and on until you put a hockey puck like on rubber, and then it's like 0.9. Okay, so mu is just a number between zero and one that just indicates how rough the surfaces are. So in the end of the day, what we're saying is, what we're saying in the end is that in the end, is that friction as a force is determined by two factors, the roughness of material and how hard the two materials are pressing against each other. So it's a pure number times a force measured in Newtons. And therefore we get a force measured in Newtons. Okay, that's the bottom line. So friction, so what you need to know whenever you need to calc, and obviously this came up in lab five, you've seen this before, but whenever you need to calculate the force of friction exerted by one surface on another, you need to know two things. You need to know the roughness and you need to know the normal force. Last thing is the normal force is not a memorizer. There's no formula for it. The normal force you figure out from context, from doing all your diagrams and solving F net equals MA. And like we did at least one example last week where we figured out that the normal force up on some object was equal to the MG down because we knew that the object was, was, was sitting still, but we figured that out. The, Oh. 
Whoa, what just happened? Oh no, oh no, hold on, hold on. I don't know what just happened. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. 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 I'm going to read. This. I'm going to start now. I'm going to start solving the problem. The problem that I'm assigning for eight extra points. I'm going to start solving for you right now. If I finish it, great. But just you know, you do it and resubmit. I'm not. It's not about hide the ball. But um. But if I don't finish it, still. I okay. Anyway. Um. Uh, so what this says here is the friction force exerted by one surface on another is determined by two factors. Oh, wait. So this is what that equation means. So this is a new equation, F equals mu times N. And by the way, you might know from lab or you might know from other places, yes, technically there's two different types of mu. There's one for a case when things are already moving relative to each other. And there's one for when they're not yet moving. That's true. That's okay. If you know that, that's great. But, but we don't need that um micro level distinction for right now it's a detail um so the friction force exerted by one surface on another is determined by two factors one is the roughness of the materials that's mu mu is often given um but sometimes like in lab you have to figure it out two the other factor is how hard the materials are pressing against each other that's n the normal force if you know those two factors, you literally multiply them together and you get the friction force. Um, please note, like in a problem like this that we're about to do, when mu is given, that means the coefficient is given. That means the roughness of the materials is being given because that can be independently measured in the lab. But that's not the force itself. Like people do make this mistake a lot. Mu is not the force. Mu is one of the two factors that together contribute to the force that get multiplied together. So in order to get the friction force, you need to know mu and you need to know the normal force and you multiply them together to get the friction force. The normal force, please know, and it says right here, there's no formula for the normal force. Please never memorize any, there's nothing to memorize that says the normal force is always equal to blah. Some people think that the normal force is always equal to mg or something, not true. Some people think the normal force is always equal to mg cosine theta, not true. The normal force is whatever it is in a given situation. And sometimes there isn't a normal force, in which case there's no friction. Um, so it always has to be computed by doing the procedures that we're about to do. So we're about to do that. So now I'm going to turn to this problem that I'm assigning. Again, if you want the full eight points, you got to do the full procedure, like all the diagrams, like your ultimate goal is to solve for the acceleration. But in order to get there, we're going to do the whole process, system schemas, free body diagrams, components, et cetera. Okay, so here we go. So, okay, I'm going to turn. To, so. But everything I just said about friction is now true in general, always about friction. We're going to... Do, this okay so we have this problem horizontal hall the problem is that on the first page you've got in front of you we've got a table on, i'm sorry we've got a box we got a box on a table. The table is rough and the box is being pulled by some pull P on an angle of 30 or 60 degrees, right? So that's what we're imagining. We're imagining some box that's being pulled by a string on an angle and it's on a table and the table is rough. So there's a lot going on, right? So first we're going to draw a system schema.
of the box itself, right? Okay, so here we go. So first I'm gonna draw a dotted circle that represents that box, the box of mass M, right? Okay, so then, I'm, so I'm gonna, okay, stop me if I'm gonna to try to do this a little bit quickly, guys, I feel like we've done this before. Okay, so I'm gonna draw a planet Earth because it's always there, it's always pulling on everything. I'm gonna draw it wherever I want. Here it is, planet Earth or center of Earth or whole Earth, whatever you want to call it. So that's, that's pulling on the box. Then I'm going to draw anything and everything that's directly touching the box, right? So there was a string that was pulling with a force P for pull, a string that was pulling up at an angle. And I draw it wherever I want. So this is a string. Okay, that was touching the box. Then the box was on a table. The table was a surface, the box. Hey, bottom of the box is a surface. It's two surfaces pushing against each other. So I draw a circle for that table, but I realize that the table is pushing the box. The surface of the table is pushing the surface of the box. So that surface pushing, so that gets two lines, that, according to my system schema rule. And that's it. Nothing else is touching the box, right? The string is touching the box. A table is touching the box. And planet Earth is without touching, pulling the box. So there's my system schema. Four lines are in it. That indicates there's going to be four forces that I'm going to have to um, indicate in my free body diagram. So that's step one, the system schema. Boom. Um, so now we go and stop me if, just stop me. So now draw a pure free body diagram of the box. Okay, so here we go. So I'm gonna draw now, I'm gonna follow the rules of pure free body diagram. I'm gonna draw a dot that represents the center of the box. I'm gonna draw, now I'm gonna draw one arrow for each of those lines in the system schema. So I draw a downward arrow that represents the pull from planet Earth, otherwise known as weight, or in free body diagrams, we call it MG, right? Then that string was pulling the box like up and to the right. So, uh, and I don't know if that's, well, The, the uh, it was a really big number. It was like 200 newtons or something. So I think it's a really big force. So I'm guessing it's a really long arrow, you know, longer, bigger than the weight of the box. The weight, I think was like 30 newtons. So, so we got P going like that. Okay. Now the box is on a table. The, ta the surface of the table is pushing in two ways. It's pushing perpendicular to the plane of contact. We call that the normal force. And notice, right, so the table is pushing up perpendicular to the plane of contact. So we call that the normal force N. And notice I'm making that arrow kind of small. You might think, doesn't that arrow have to equal the MG? Remember the big speech I gave last week. First of all, normal force does not have to equal MG. They are opposite in direction, but there's no law that says that they have to be equal in magnitude. You might say, what about Newton's third law? But Newton's third law says the earth pulls the box down, the box pulls the earth up. The law does not say that if the earth pulls the box down, that a table has to push the box up. In other words, they are not an action reaction pair. I might list the pairs in a moment. Uh, um, in fact, I will list them in a moment, but I think that the table is pushing up only slightly on the box. Why do I think that? Because someone's also pulling up the box with a string, right? If this box, the, if this box is being ultimately gliding along the table horizontally, like it's called horizontal hall, if ultimately the box is not accelerating up or down, then I think all of the vertical forces must be balanced. Well, there's a vertical component to that pull. The person's pulling. So I think the person's helping the table support the box. I don't think the table is fully responsible for supporting the weight of the box. So I think the table's doing less. This is all my qualitative sense of the situation. But I think that upward arrow of the normal is, is not as big as MG, just say, right? But then there's one more arrow, which is the friction, resisting the box being pulled that way. Friction goes parallel to the plane of contact. So it goes like this. So that is my free body, my pure 
free body diagram of the box, right? I, I should say now also. Say to be. Um, I'm going to list. I'm going to very quickly li list all action reaction pairs. Just to be absolutely clear here, there's four forces. I think there's four action reaction pairs, not two actions and two reactions, four actions and four reactions. In other words, I'm just to remind, I'm going to list how Newton's third law works here. So this is 2B, and I'm going to, I'm going to do it on the next page somewhat quickly. I think it's like, and please include this if you want the eight points, just include this part as well. I'm going to say one, like MG, the earth pulls down on the box. So the box pulls up on the earth. That's pair one. Two, the tension string pulls up and right on the box. Therefore, the box pulls down and left on the string. You see what I'm saying? And th so they're not, well, you see what I'm saying. Then three, the normal force, the table pushes up on the box. So the box pushes down on the table. That's the normal, right? You see the normal is not the reaction to gravity. The normal is its own pair. It, okay, I think you see what I, and finally the friction means that the table pushes left on the box. It's, it's, it's resisting and it's slowing it down. And therefore the box pushes right on the table. Those are the four pairs. I'm going to just go on now because we have 12 minutes. I want to, but think about that. Bottom line is action and reaction are never in the same diagram. Everything in a diagram is an action and has a reaction in some other diagram that you're not seeing. Just, whatever, you can think about that. Now, moving on. Um, what's the next step in order to analyze for acceleration? The next step is now, and this is what we haven't really, we didn't really get to last week yet. The next step, step three, is break. Force vectors into components lying along coordinate axes. So we have to choose axes. Remember, this all goes back to Galileo and all the problems with your first exam. We've do, the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames or in all unaccelerated coordinate systems. The, wh whatever coordinate system you pick, the laws are the same. They'll still operate. But you have to pick a coordinate system and stay in it. So I'm picking a coordinate system. I'm assuming I've got a y-axis like this and an x-axis like this. Like That's how I'm looking at the problem. And this is positive, and this is positive, let's say. So, so any vector that's not lined up with one of those axes, I'm going to break into components, each of which what lies along the axis, like you did with the whole free float problem in the exam, or like we did with displacement vectors in lab three. I'm going to break. So I'm going to look at any vector that's not lined up with the x-axis or the y-axis. I'm going to break into two components. There is one such vector. In this case, the vector is the, 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 the tension of the string going on a diagonal. Like the tension is going like this. I mean, excuse me. The, so 
So I'm going to say it really has two components. So anything pulling, uh, anything, anything pulling up into the right is pulling somewhat up and somewhat. Oh my god! And the board just got lost in there. Is the board still? Hold on, I see the board is freaking out. Well, I'm freaking out. Hold on, I'll fix the board in a sec. I see the board is frozen. Hold on. What is happening here? It's coming, it's coming. Here it comes, here it comes. Okay, we're almost there. Probably, and I know we have eight minutes. It's coming. It's it should be coming. It's coming. Okay. Okay. So what I did, I'm zooming in on the T. And by the way, I, the P and the T. T stands for tension in the string. The P meant someone's pulling the string. So I've gotten more specific and called it T for tension. It, it doesn't really matter if you call it P or T. But um, so I'm saying if it's pulling up and to the right at some angle. Then from Sokotoa, right? The I can make that up and to the right means to the right plus up. The up component is the opposite from the angle. The over component is adjacent to the angle. So one is hypotenuse times adjacent, the other is hypotenuse times opposite, right? So what's the purpose of doing that? The purpose of zooming in on that one vector is to now to say, okay. I can substitute in, in my original diagram, instead of, I don't want any diagonal lines in my diagram. I want everything to be along axes. So I redraw the diagram. So the component diagram now looks like this. The, the component diagram is mg is down, normal force is up, friction is over, right? But now, instead of having a diagonal line, we have like, P or T cosine theta, and we have it up T sine theta. You see, th and this is important. A component diagram takes any diagonal lines, any off axis lines, and replaces them, fully replaces them with their constituent components. So notice the diagonal line is gone. Now, and this is a mistake people make a lot. The diagonal line is gone in its place. It, so T is gone. In its place is T sine theta and T cosine theta. We are saying that the job of T is really done independently, but simultaneously by T cosine theta and T sine theta. Okay? Um, now, the purpose of all this is now, finally, with six minutes left, now, We've got a bunch of arrows that are either just on the x-axis or just on the y-axis, nothing else. So now we can apply at net equals ma. This is the, the last step, right? And even if I don't finish it here, this is a lot for you, I think. Um, step four is apply f net equals ma to solve for a. And how do we do that? How do we do that? We apply it independently, but simultaneously to each axis. So we're going to say, okay, x-axis first, f net x equals max. So we look at the x-axis. Everything going to the right, we call positive. Everything going to the left, we call negative. And we add it all up. So on the x-axis, we literally have t, cosine theta, and we have numbers for these. We'll put in the numbers, but I'm saving that for last. You can do that. T cosine theta to the right minus friction to the left equals max, right? Now, what, it, what is friction? Friction, we said, friction force is always mu times the normal. 
Okay, so I substituted in T cosine theta minus mu times the normal equals MA times X. And by the way, MAX, especially if I run out of time, MAX is what we're solving for, right? The, we're solving for how, like this, we're pulling this thing with a string. We're pulling it diagonally just because it makes it easier for leverage, but it glides along or it slides along the horizontal tabletop horizontally. So AX is the rate at which it's going to accelerate horizontally along the table. That's what we're solving for. Okay. Can we solve for it just yet? No, we can't because we still don't know. Like we're solving for this but we don't know N. There's no formula for N. How can we get N? Ah, we look to the other axis, right? There's two axes here. So we have more information. And this is why we divide everything up. So we go to the other axis and guess what? We're just about done. It'll just be up to you to do the arithmetic, basically. We go to the other axis, the Y axis. And then the Y axis, what we have is T sine theta is pointing up plus the normal force is pointing up, minus mg is pointing down, right? All that together equals ma sub y. Do we know a sub y, the acceleration in the vertical direction? Heck yes, we do. It's zero. This thing is not flying up. It's not flying down. It's just gliding across, right? So this, so a sub y, oops, sorry. A sub y is zero. So we can literally say T sine theta plus N equals mg. And by the way, that's what I was saying when I drew the picture. Like it's not that N equals, N, well, in other words, N, therefore N equals mg minus T sine theta. What does that mean? First of all, it's another reminder. Don't ever memorize that N in general equals anything. It doesn't. It depends on each situation. In this situation, what we're saying is the tabletop is supporting the weight of the object minus whatever that string is doing vertically, right? The string is T sine theta plus N equals MG means the vertical component of the string is helping the table support the weight. So the table only has to do some of the support force, right? So now we substitute that in. to the x-axis and we'll be done. And, you, and I think this, and then you're just going to plug in the numbers and you'll get it. If you just do all this clearly and cleanly and present, just do, maybe I'll even give more than eight points. I don't think about it, but like, just be really neat and clear and awesome and just present this whole thing. And then finally at the end, plug in the numbers and get a number up, but I'll show you what you're going to plug in and, and you'll be good. You got a week to do it. We could still talk about it on next week, but basically I'm then saying, fine, in the end of the day, but this is how, this is as comp, this is, one step shy of your lab. Well, anyway, what I'm saying then is uh, T cosine theta minus mu times mg minus sine theta equals m a x. And, and you are solving for a sub x, and you have you have every other uh yes you have been given every other number to plug in and that's how you get it and that's it okay so i hope you're all okay i, I um i apologize i'm still getting some of the exams back i will still get them back i please contact me with any questions other than that i will see you monday i hope you have a good weekend oh yeah uh i that's a good question caroline remind me right at the beginning of next class uh yeah thank you guys thank you yes remind me like i'm not gonna go over it all over again i don't think but i'll pick up from where we are next time and i'll answer any questions about it like i'll slow down and kind of review it a little bit. i don't know if that is, i mean but goodbye guys i don't know if that's answering your question Caroline. but like in other words you can definitely ask me questions about it on monday for sure if it helps you to do it at home for sure so before we do anything else in class on monday i'll answer any questions about it Maybe I'll even plug in the numbers and get an answer if you want, maybe, but wait, uh, okay, okay. I, I, and I see the question in the direct chat, give me one second. But uh, if that makes, oh, okay, okay, cool, cool. Okay. Um, okay, I'm just fixing that. Okay, wait, okay. So day, let me stop.